Aaron Fletcher has been preparing his community for the end of the world for 15 years. He chose to be homeless in his early 20s. This is the first project that I actually, um, I actually felt called to complete what I call a community survival guide. And the whole idea is that this is something that's portable. They can, you'll never have to leave home without it if you put it in your wallet. You know the old slogan of, of MasterCard? Don't leave home without it. I called it disaster card instead of MasterCard. Hold on, let me get the shot. Quickly run through what's in there as you leave through. A simplified constitutional rights list was uh, the most important thing to, to know Why? first. Um, because in a post-apocalypse situation, you're probably um, going to stand the chance of there being like some kind of a police state. And I want people to be able to, to stand up for their rights so that um, we don't have totalitarianism. The next page is Survival Spanish. Uh, this took me the longest uh, because I don't why know. Was, why was that something you decided to include? Uh, because we're sharing a border with Mexico and we got a lot of, uh, a lot of people who live here who So like what are some of the Spanish. phrases in there? The last page is the group decision making. This is the most important page right here because none of that means anything. Individual survival is going to be hell. We need to learn how to thrive with each other. And the consensus decision making process is key. These are things that, there's not a lot of calories in any of these things. Exactly, and that's, that's, that's when I started getting into where are we gonna get our calories consistently, and that's when I, uh, I found out about the Heifer Organization, their findings. Uh, the dairy animals were by far the most uh, calorically net positive way of, of producing your um, own calories. We met multiple times to draft a new urban livestocking laws that we then brought to the city council and had them vote on it. I bought two miniature-sized dairy goats along with a handheld manual milking machine and got them a little crate shelter and I uh, loaned them out and we shared the milking duties and the milk supply. And these people that agreed to a one month minimum yarding would uh, flip-flop on me before the one month and so I had to walk around more and more with my dairy sheep. This is the map that I made of all the fruit and nut trees in Ashland, Oregon. In other words, in the, the, the very suburban area of Ashland, if you were to walk around and use this map, you'd know where the trees are that produce uh, edible food. Yeah, and they're all uh, publicly accessible. So they're like, they might be on private property, but they're overgrowing the sidewalk so that you can collect off the ground on the sidewalk. So why, why did you undertake that project? I saw it as a... Um, as a necessary thing um, for uh, local food security. So I put it for free up on my website. I was put into a legendary Locals Ashland book and still is sold in the library today before I even got goats because of all the activism that I was doing in town. That's why they uh, targeted me with that no livestock walking through town. Eventually, the Ashland City Council passed a law requiring special permits to bring any livestock, except horses, into town. So if Aaron Fletcher gets a horse, he's going to be able to walk it all over town. That's how Aaron ended up uh, traveling around shepherding. Um, right now, I'm posted up for a second working for this dairy sheep farm and uh, breeding my dairy sheep. I've made a couple different types of teepees over the last several years that are wearable. This is the 
wearable teepee that I've been using uh, for the last year straight and it's uh, by far my favorite and I think it's the most reproducible by far. Paracorded much better. Bailing string sucks. Throw it over you. Got a wearable teepee. You got a hood. And I use bamboo poles because they're light and I can bundle them together into a walking stick for traveling. We're in Ashland, Oregon right now uh, and we're needing to get up to Portland, past Portland, um, within about 12 days uh, to pick up a, a ewe that's in milk that uh, we put a, put a deposit down on. Now on a story we first brought you yesterday, we tracked down the nomadic shepherd who's traveling around on foot with a sheep on a leash. He'd been seen walking around Canby recently, and today we caught up with Aaron Fletcher and his sheep, JC, at a park between Wilsonville and Newburgh. He says the point of his lifestyle is health, and it's healthy to move and flow in some way. Fletcher says you have to break routine to learn, grow, and be happy. He specifically focused on local food sustainability. M more producers and less consumers and you know start turning this uh, unsustainable ship around is that uh, is that we could just get a producer pet these feed you and they feed themselves and they can clothe you and Fletcher drinks the milk his sheep produces he says too many people are dependent on the grid and that people should take food supply into their own hands This plant that she's eating here is called salsify. There's also a yellow flowered version. Uh, people often call goat's beard. Uh, they're basically the same thing. Um, this one has a usually larger uh, is usually larger in size and has a larger root. But all parts of it are edible, raw, and. Once the, the flowers open and then close, and then they, before they start to open uh, back up into a puff ball, like a, a huge dandelion, um, before they, they open up into that, you can pull out the seeds. Now here's a full head of seeds. It's awesome. I don't know if you got that. You can eat the rest of it, but I don't like the texture. The rest of it, flowers all right. Seeds are awesome. The seeds are actually sweet. Sometimes the uh, the roots of the purple one are sweet. Sometimes too. Crazy. Hi. Hi. I'm looking for familiar faces. The Pennington Farm. This is the same Pennington Farm that deals their stuff at the. Uh... The farmers market. Yeah. yeah. Where's the family at? Uh, and it... Kathy and Dylan are in the back. They never told me that they had the coolest farm stand ever. Not a lot of people know about us because we're so like in the middle of nowhere. Not, no, we're making our way towards the coast, and I saw uh, I, saw your Pennington Farms, I and I was so happy. It's so nice to see you. Because I didn't know there's that, a goat out there. I'm like, I think I know who it is. I did not know that know, you guys I had a farm stand. This is us. And this is a beautiful is, farm stand. All right, back on the Billings farm, watching the goats again for the day, making sure they don't get out on the eighth of mile fence line. Mm -hmm. Uh, of non-operable electric fencing or non-respected <laughs> electric fencing it works the goats just don't respect it they don't feel pain and they crawl right through and there's a highway right on the other side of uh, the field up there so keeping them in in the property and safe and the goats are obviously skinnier than they were a month and a half ago when I left, I got their hip bones showing because they haven't been out. They haven't, they haven't had anyone here to watch them to be able to let them out. Yeah, that one. She was so fat when I left. This one right here. The one right there was so fat and healthy when I left. Now she looks not only skinny, but she looks mangy. 
their hair was shiny when I left. Good goats, you're getting your good food now. See if I can bulk you guys up before you start kidding here in a couple months. One year of wool and you got, got a lot here. Oh my gosh, you got like eight inch staples. I got a mama, got a haircut. Good girl. You were so patient. It's been five years though since she's been sheared. She, they said it was four or five years. What a good it. llama, Ruby. Right. You're sheared. Done shearing. Let me free you up. Oh, yeah, yeah, go. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, you're free. You done spitting? Look at all that spit. You all right? Oh, it's not too bad, punctures. Oh, my God, that just scared you, huh? You probably, you probably started to cut off your circulation. You look, kind of look like you were knocked out when I first got down here. I hope you didn't do any damage to your, your pipe. Breathe. You can breathe. You can breathe. Good sheep. I'm sorry I had to run down here. You all right? You want to try to get up? Try to get up? Good goat. Oh, my God. We were up on the top of that hill. I started yelling at him when I was down by the fence post. I saw him run off when I was about halfway between the fence posts and here. He ran off. I thought everyone was walking a little fast. And I thought you were taking a little long to catch up with him. And then when you turned around, I saw that there was a little baby goat next to your side. But it wasn't on your side. It was latched onto your neck, wasn't it? It was a little, little coyote. Oh, it did transfer the flavor. I, I taste the violet. Oh, that's so cool. I'm gonna make some cheese, violet cheese. You're too funny looking. You have a toupee. That's what happens when the shepherd isn't here. I lost five goats while I was uh, gone for a month and a half, walking out to the coast. Goodios! Goodios! Good goats! Good girl, go get yourself. Good boy, Willie, thank you for carrying the foxes. Let's go. Good good yos. And I heard right now that uh, this year, this is the third year I've been um, shepherding for this farm and uh, the herd is only around uh, 40 right now. And usually it's upwards of 80 or 100. She sold a lot of them. Hi. Hi. No, no apples or pears today. Yep. We're trading to live on a farm is a good deal for the farmhand working minimally to have what you need and it's also a good deal for the farmers because they get what they need uh, taken care of and they don't have to pay money you ready daddy i get to live rent free in exchange for my work trade my shepherding work trade. This is a good, a good job for, uh, for people to consider in the future. I've been working with wool for almost five years now, spinning, uh, weaving, and felting. This is my new super simple way for everyone to be able to make their own clothing. You don't need any tools at all. All you need is two large cardboard boxes and two hands. I made this felted vest uh, from JC's mom's wool. Her name was Penny. Um, I made this like f at least four years ago. I've been wearing this four winters. I think it's actually been five winters. This is amazing. I made it really thick. Um, and I need to start making everything this thick so that it'll last this long because and this one I only made half as thick and this is the third winter 
that uh, I've been wearing it. And this is the last winter that it'll be useful. This is the first winter um, that I'm wearing these. I made these this fall. And yeah, they go down to, they're about three-fourths lengths. They go down to about right there, just past my knee. And so I only got three, three felted layers that I'm wearing this winter. And then I'm wearing uh, the scarf that I wove out of llama wool that I sheared. And then this is an alpaca hat um, from an alpaca that I sheared. Um, this has lasted me two, three years now, and this is this is the first winter. Actually, the second winter this has been through. So that's my wool garment lineup for this winter. Watching a couple of my farmer's goats. Um, taking them across the street here to the best possible graze because these are uh, very malnourished, very weak goats. These are the weakest leeks. So we're grazing them over here. Try to get them healthy. I had to use a wheel, I had to use this wheelbarrow to get this one down here and one of the other ones. Because this one is so, so skinny. You can, look, I'm pushing from this side and you can see your finger coming through the other side and it's got diarrhea scours. Come over here and eat with your, with your friends. Good girl, at least you're eating. Yeah, good girl. Happy, healthy girl. Good girl. This is their body count, you can see. And this one's the second worst. This one I had to, I had to wheelbarrow out this one because she was collapsing, trying to walk out here. All right, Willie's got a year's supply of wild parsley. He's packing. We got the 10 pounds of wild parsley that I picked yesterday drying out on my sleeping bag. So I took a, a hedge trimmer and cut paths, like six or seven paths, through these blackberries. Good girls, yeah! That's what it looks like from the other side. They're loving it. New blackberries exposed for you to munch on, yeah. No. I'm leaving you in freckles. I'm gonna leave ya. Eating some acorn oatmeal. Yum. I actually like it. The burn stuff on the bottom is makes for texture. Scrape it up. You dork. Yeah. There you go. Happy goat. And there I'm about to milk, and I hear these goats way up the hill crying out, looking for the rest of the crew. So I just called out to them. And they came running down here. They didn't know which direction to go. Good use! Yeah! Yeah! Now can you find them? Now do you know where they are at? They're down there. You know where they're at? Do I have to lead you down there? Seriously? What the F? Come on. Let's go! Good use! Come on! You guys gotta start staying with your crew, yo. Good, good. There you go. Now y'all find them. They're back there. Good goats. Little rogue crew. Gotta stay with the main pack. Dorks. Alright, so. My farmer's cow just um, calved the other day and I only had a single and it was having really enlarged udders and um, she brought it in so that uh, we could start um, hand milking it so that um, to relieve its pressure in the beginnings of mastitis. She said something about an ulcer, ulceration which I had seen yesterday which is this and she just told me to um, milk milk 
all four out completely. And when I came around to the side, I saw this. And I don't even think she knows. Because if she did know about that ulceration, then she wouldn't have me milking out entirely um, of that teat at all. You guys are ready to go out, but you got three of your family over there with their heads stuck and you're screaming. So, I'll be right back. Yeah. Ah! You guys are crazy. I just put in that sixth line. Go on. You guys came across. You guys will have to get back through. Yep, it'll shock you, and then you'll learn. So I was wondering if uh, if we could get a, a clip on record to put at the end of uh, of the video that I made for your farm. The main projects that you had me working on was digging that uh, irrigation. Yeah, the cleaning irrigation and ditches, the working on blackberries. You know, weed eating and 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 maintaining maintaining an electrical fence. And do, do you feel like that was a, a beneficial um, oh, partnership? Oh, definitely. I, I hope that that brings hope to other people that they can, uh, with discretion. Um, and with uh, initial boundaries, um, start to work with people to make them farmhands and uh, uh, utilize that, uh, that untapped resource, really. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to get uh, this year again. I appreciate um, uh, uh, being able to work uh, with your farm again. To be able to let my goats out and watch them, that has been so meaningful to me and so helpful to me. We just picked up our, the base of our covered wagon. He's going to work on the cover and uh, it'll be welded on top. This is my ram turning the wagon on a dime. He has no problem. We got new 24 inch bicycle wheels. Hubs are way better than those wagon. Just cartwheels, cheap ones. Good boy. All right, we're work trading in Talent, Oregon uh, to stay on this land and to simply be on the land. Uh, we don't bother them for, try not to bother them for anything. Uh, no electricity, no water, anything. Um, here is some water on the edge of their property and this is where I've been getting uh, our water. I love this little shower. I've had a three gallon version of it and it was way bigger than was necessary for just taking showers out of. And it was hard to carry. It looks like we're perfectly on time to pick the wild onions and get my year's supply of onion. It's so flavorful. In comparison to like onions, like if I filled this thing up with chopped onions, it would only last me like, even if it was able to you know stay pristine and preserved, it would only last me like a week or two, maybe. <laughs> but these are like 10 times more flavorful uh, than uh, onion, cultivated onion bulbs. So, uh, this will definitely last me a whole year um, because I collected a, a one gallon bag. I collected about half of this last two years ago, it was. I collected about half of this and it fed me for like three months uh, and I didn't even put a dent in the bag. Good morning, my silly sheep. Yeah. Good morning. We're goat sitting. Yes. And we're chicken sitting. We gotta open the chickens. And there you go, chickens. Oh my goodness, you guys got so many chickens. Good chick, 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 chickens. Congratulations. Yeah. Good goats. Such a good girl. Yeah. Good sheep. And good goats. And good chickens. There. Homestead sitting. Uh, my friend's little farm. Here. 
for uh, the last four or five days. And been milking their goat. Got my cheeses that I've been making. And about to make another one. Got a gallon and a half of the sheep milk here. A little over a gallon and a half. Wait till I get two gallons so I can make a big wheel. And then I've got a half gallon and another half gallon of her goat's milk. Starting to ripple. Starting to get the little ripples. Just made some new sandals. New felted wool sandals. So thick and dense. It was that. higher than that. Did it shrink? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that cool? How it shrinks? Yeah. I'm, I'm making some sandals. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking soles. Yeah, soles for your shoes would be better. It would be really good because they're not quite thick enough to make uh, like my sandal. My wool sandals, um, but they're definitely thick enough to make some nice insoles. That's cool. Here, I'll do this later. How easy was it for you to make that? You picked apart the wool, you agitated it, did most of the agitation, didn't you? Yeah. And it was pretty easy? Yeah. Awesome. So you're gonna be set for next winter. You're gonna have some warmer boots, huh? Yeah, especially in Mount Shasta. Nice. I should make socks. Yeah, the socks are really fun to make. That'll be the next thing you make, huh? Yeah. All right. Raised bed made next to this. So I'm going to dig out part of this mound right here. And... Right. We got potatoes growing in this one. And we got an assortment of herbs in this one. Uh, and vegetables in the back that are taller. There we go. Happy goats, yeah. Happy goats. Yeah. Good goats. Good boy, Wooly. I guess uh, all this to the left of the railroad tracks is railroad track property. And they got to maintain these blackberries, so my friends live right on the other side of these blackberries. I figure I'll bring them out here and stake them and let them help the railroad company. And help themselves at the same time. Get some good food. We got acorns all over right here. And I just got two of them tethered. I got the two alphas. That's the follower. So she doesn't need a leash. And these two are pregnant right now. So you know, a little on the skinny side. So this is really helping to bulk them up. And the uh, last days of their gestation. I got my felted wool socks patched the heel was starting to break through and it was also starting to break through right there on my outside of my forefoot other than that they are sound these lasted two months before uh, popping those holes at this density Yeah. Good sheep. Good sheep. All right, I'm chicken sitting again for the weekend. Today I'm gonna use my manual grain grinder and my ghost son to make um, make you guys the all amaranth bread. I've got a whole year's supply of amaranth over here that I collected. I have this whole bin. Right. Got my new face-to-face -face look shirt filled in. This is the one with the front and the back.
I was living out of the pack boxes, I was living under an umbrella. A, a number of different uh, shelters that, that I made before that, like little wearable teepees and, and little miniature teepees. Walking the sheepies from that paddock over there with my teepee that we're work trading for. It's raining, so I go for my poncho. I invented this new type of poncho. It's eight foot by eight foot, so it's square. Therefore, it only needs to be tied up to one tree. I'm warm waiting for them to get full. Warm my little freestanding wool teepee that I can do this with. What's snowing out outside of our little freestanding sheepy? Keep us warm while we're waiting for your your parents to graze. There they are. This is freestanding clothing that acts as a tent that used to be defined as camping paraphernalia. So I sleep in across the back, and they have the front front half. It's so awesome. Yeah. What I'm doing here, you guys have heard of guerrilla gardening, right? A guerrilla gardening is utilizing vacant lots, unused lots to garden and make use of. It's a vacant lot. I'm taking my sheep through here for more than five years now. No farms have access to this good graze in February. What I'm doing is I, I'm calling guerrilla grazing. Scale of one to 10, this is a 10 for sure. Freaking awesome. This your guys' land too? Is it all right when we walk through? Thank you. So I walk on the curb and let my sheep graze this side strip. Oh, yeah. So your half of this is all right with you? <laughs> We're there. That's their half. Yeah, sure. All right, well, when we walk through, all right, you're awesome. Have a good day. I grill a garden for 10 years. Good boy. This is 10 times at least more efficient than gorilla gardening because I'm harvesting multiple times a day. I'm converting what's already here into milk. So yeah, now we got clean milk. It's assured. Whereas like when you grill a garden, they could sell the property, they could mow it down, they could, a deer could eat it. This is assured. Multiple times a day harvest. Every morning I shake the night before's milk into butter. This is the butter I got. Big hard block of butter from just two days of milking them and cutting down the poison hemlock. Most of the stuff that I'm doing, I, I do just to show people that you can do it. A scythe is the best tool for managing poison hemlock. Like I don't need to make money, I don't really want to make money. I, I want to stay as mentally free as possible to do new things. I'm not like a normal prepper is in like, like a, a, I call it selfish prepper, prepping. Uh, I'm a community prepper. Like I'm not so interested in trying to survive in a post-apocalyptic situation if everyone around me is suffering. So I'm trying to like uh, figure out, bring up the community so that uh, they can all thrive. Flavor is escaping. Oh my goodness. Potatoes, wild parsley, wild garlic, bulbs, and three different types of my sheep's very aged cheese. I'm making some wild carrot flour, sheep sorrel, and lavender. And then topped off with sheep cheddar cheese, wild amaranth. Yeah. This bread ball I rolled in the wild sweet pea flour. Chicory flour, chicory leaf. They make larger ones in this, larger tubes, but they're not nearly as efficient as this diameter. I didn't even go all the way through these bushes, but... We got a bunch of salsify here. My sheep's eating the salsify. And we got one right here. All parts of it are edible, raw. It's got actually a pretty awesome tap root that's easy to pull up, even in like hard soil. But this is called hawk's beard. It's still a wild edible plant, but it's just not nearly as palatable or nice of a texture. I'm gonna fry it all up with my sheep's butter. Wild sweet pea shoots, mustard greens, wild parsley, and wild onions. Two different types of my sheep's cheese. I'll fry it up in my sheep's butter. I've been mapping out all the wild edibles that I know of in the community that I'm in over the last couple years. So I started with trees, and then I started the ground plants. I just put dots uh, where there is spring water coming out. I mapped out the nutritional content of each of these plants. Two biggest problems right now is our small farmers being put out of business so that we don't have a, enough local food security. Problem number two is we have an exponentially growing homelessness problem. And so what I'm seeing is that those two problems can actually work together to become their own solutions. They are the perfect candidates for being farmhands, the free farmhands. 
Let's go. Here's the thing. Is that all the, the small struggling farmers need affordable labor help. And the one thing that they can trade instead of having to, to pay for that labor is living space. And so living in a tent at the very least, if you're homeless on a, a farm's land is a great deal. Not only for the homeless, but also for the farmer. If we can figure out how to, at first, it just promote the idea that the homeless can do that, then it'll start that ball rolling. It's been a huge help for me because like, I've been a homeless by choice uh, so that I could have more mind space to receive these things for like 12 years now. Good sheep. Good boy. Bring him in. Good boy. How often are you shearing? I shear my sheep twice a year. Come here, buddy. Let's get some water down your throat. Let's see. In order to keep their sick animals hydrated and or to flush them with medications and stuff. Gonna need some liquids. You are really skinny. Just like 30 mile an hour ones. Not too bad yet. It gets to 50 mile an hour ones here. Sheep don't care as much about rain as goats. Not nearly. Eight hours later, there's still coals in my wood stove. Kept my bed warm all night. I literally didn't add any wood last night. And I'm boiling down the way from making cheese two days ago. Oh my goodness, this stove is so awesome. And these solar stoves are so awesome. I can't believe I even lived without them. I got potatoes boiled in my sheep's milk. Before I was trying to, to just consume my milk and what was extra barter it for like local food. I traded my sheep milk and some pear butter for their pickled beets and eggs. I eat a half of it. And this is amazing. Lemon ferment. Rabbit meat. Yeah, put some of my sheep's milk. I wasn't diversifying my diet enough because I was trying to keep it to just trading the milk with the local farmers, which wasn't enough. I wasn't getting enough of a bartering response. And so I was lacking in certain things, especially vitamin C. Local Dunbar wheat, organic olive oil. Now it's way easier because I'm open to accepting things from the grocery store. I'm not going so local extremist. There is about a gallon full of grain. Until I can get enough people, you know, that can supplement my diet adequately enough. Making cheese in the snow. In the snow. I'm gonna make a, a new cheese mold. The idea is to be able to do that before crap hits the fan because that's all you'll be able to rely on. If you're a prepper or whatever and you think that that's gonna happen, then it's important to get enough of a diversity of bartering partners. But a property sitting job is something that everyone can do as long as they're responsible and, and trustworthy. Oh my God. Pretty good for just being made out of a, a wagon, huh? Absolutely. It's fresh milk this morning. Oh my God. <laughs> Until crap hits the fan, an ice cream machine is going to be very helpful for anyone who has a dairy pet who is wanting to make use of that excess milk. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I, it's, it's donation based. That's, I'll be right back. No, thank you. Thank no, you. Really, That's I mean... freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. We saw this little pop-up market and, and so yeah, farm stand with farm food, sheep ice cream here is my new sign. <laughs> I'm gonna set these out in the sun. Heating it helps to draw the whey out of the curd quicker. The only reason that people, they age their cheeses in cheese caves at like 55 degrees is to slow down the microbes. So you, you ripen cheeses and once they get perfectly ripe, then you send them off to market. 
the best way to, to catch that at the, right at the beginning and to have the widest window of marketability, best buy date, is by going slow. You can go fast. You just have to be, you have to be a quicker juggler. And this is like really complex cheeses, like because basically nowadays they pasteurize all of the natural microbes, like dozens of microbes that come stock in the milk. Yeah. They pasteurize it and then they put in a basically a genetically mod modified culture. You silly sheep! Jay-Z's begging for a treat through my curtain. Oh, my sterilizing our world has made people healthier and safer but i think that if you don't if you don't use it you lose it and your immune system is part of that you can't even get this creamy with cream cheese i've been aging this cheese for a couple weeks if not three weeks without any refrigeration and i think if i take it past this point it might get too dry but the rind might get too large Ooh, interesting cut into it like it has a hard cut into and it slips in the inside still soft it feels like wow three week old cheese aged in a paper bag without any refrigeration all right cutting open one of my stinky cheeses it's like a limburger we used to consume so many more microbes through a less sanitary lifestyle those microbes, it's a double-edged sword because they do help give our immune system practice. That inside solid is starting to get pretty ripened. It's the stuff that starts to get really stinky. It does also introduce more rolls of the dice that there could be an imbalanced microbe. Mm. But if it doesn't kill you, then it makes you stronger because then you have immunity to that next time that that microbe comes around your colony. Sheep cheese. The local bacon. Yes, it, it's made people healthier who were weaker. At the last of the lamb rams meat, I got some of my sheep's cheese in there too. But it's made all of us weaker by sterilizing our, our environment. Look at my Jenny. Look at my Jenny. Got a lamb, egg, and potato for dinner tonight. Cheap cheesy potatoes. When you think about culturing your own food. Whipped sour cream. And you experience that in comparison to coming from like a domesticated, overly sanitized diet like I've come from, it's it, like night and day. All right, my grilled sheep cheese is ready. I can only say that I've experienced that my body prefers a healthy, mix of microbes and does not prefer an overly sterilized environment or diet and this slides into the back and is what my shower goes on but i'm gonna be having an entire rack so that a tailgate can be lowered down so it'll be like a fold down bathroom i got i got a sign for packages for the for the guys back there it's really important to let people know right now that not only do farms need farm hands free farmhands, affordable farmhands, but there's a huge opening for property sitters is what I'm trying to say. Specifically with people buying their secondary or their tertiary properties and needing someone to either protect the things that are on their land or protect the land itself from being squatted on. Let's go. All right. And yeah. Why did you guys decide to, to come back and pay Aaron another visit? I mean, I think for the same reason, I think we felt like he's actually really living this way. So his life is probably going to keep evolving and he keeps trying new things. And so there's going to be a story that continues. Well, how many videos has the channel, does the channel have now? Hundreds probably. A thousand, over a thousand. Wow. Over a thousand videos. So like, wow. is, does Aaron fit into a category compared to other people? There's nobody else doing what Aaron's, I mean, there's no nomadic shepherds that I know of. We haven't done any videos on it. What Aaron cool. is doing is so amazing that actually Lloyd Kahn, which is kind of like, well, it's, he, he was doing basically the housing sort of section for the whole Earth catalog for a while and created shelter back publication the back in the 70s. And he actually emailed Kristen saying, I watched that video and. I want Aaron for my book, right? Did he contact you about it? Yeah, 
I just need to contact Aaron for yeah. this book. Yeah. Wow. Because you know, and he then wrote Aaron saying, you know, I want to put your yeah, yeah, your yeah. car tire in this hundred thousand dollar camper van because it yours beats the others. Yeah. In, So what I'm what I'm gathering is that you know you guys are really finding those people who are trying to lower their impact, yeah. but in like ways that do not make their lives totally suck. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I or, think that was one of the early things that we found in even with tiny houses. People saying, actually, I this is I like this. I want this because you know living with less and living smaller and having less things is sort of also declutters the mind. So this is making me happier. I feel better about this. I spent three days with Aaron in rural Oregon, documenting his attempt to live completely off-grid. Yeah. Sometimes Aaron hunts wild animals, like raccoons. At first, he hopped trains with his dog, Sam. Go on. And he used to dumpster dive for food. I just dumpstered 24 cases of unexpired hummus and six eggs. About 10 years ago, he got more serious about sustainability. He adopted goats, then sheep, and started trying to get all his food from local sources. Has anybody ever called you crazy? Yeah. <laughs> Are you crazy? It's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society and I'm obviously the least adjusted. So I would say that I'm the least crazy of anyone that I know. <laughs>